Hi, I'm Richard McKenzie, co-author of Microeconomics for MBAs. This video module will be on the impact of minimum wage laws, or laws that require employers to pay uh, their workers a minimum of some specified amount. In the United States at this time, uh, the minimum wage is $5.15 uh, an hour. Uh, some states have much higher uh, minimum wage uh, rates that employers are required to pay. In analyzing the impact of minimum wage, we can make use of the supply and demand curve uh, framework that we have developed in, in previous modules and have used in previous modules. We only need to make a small uh, modification. As opposed to putting the price on the vertical axis, we put the wage rate. The wage rate is the price of labor. And on the uh, horizontal axis, we put the quantity of labor. This can be measured in number of hours uh, worked or the number of, of workers who are, who are employed. Now, in order to understand the uh, minimum wage uh, law, all we need to do is say, suppose that Congress specifies a minimum wage that is uh, WM. We assume that it's going to be above W1 simply because any minimum wage below W1 will not have an impact on, on worker wages. The reason is that a wage rate like uh, W2 um, uh, uh, will not be effective. Workers will always receive W1. Why? Because that is the uh, equilibrium. Anyway, at a minimum wage of W1, the standard way of treating minimum wages is to recognize that the quantity of workers who are going to be demanded by their employers uh, begins uh, to shrink. On the other hand, the number of workers who want to work at this higher wage rate uh, goes, uh, goes up from Q1 uh, to Q3. We have, according to this standard sort of analysis, a surplus of labor in the market equal to uh, W3 minus uh, W2. Uh, this surplus will not be eliminated by a drop in the wage simply because uh, the wage cannot go below uh, WM. Uh, uh, what are going to be the consequences of the minimum wage? Well, if we take the analysis only this far, we can see that the number of people who, who will have jobs will go from Q1 to Q2. That, of course, is, is bad. Uh, we might just note that some workers are, uh, could be better off that is, uh, these workers, Q2 workers who retain their, their jobs uh, will in fact receive a wage of WM instead of uh, W1. Well, I have to worry about whether or not these workers, uh, Q2, will be the same workers that were hired when the wage rate was W1. And the reason is that this supply curve indicates that there are workers out there who are willing to come on to the market uh, if in fact uh, the wage rate goes up. These workers are not in this market at this time because um, uh, their opportunity cost is, is higher than the wage rate. If their opportunity cost is higher, I presume that means, uh, at least for some workers, that their productivity is higher uh, than the workers who are, who are hired at least initially. Well, when the wage rate uh, uh, comes on, we're going to have all of these workers come on to the market, and there is a good chance that employers will start uh, hiring these workers who come onto the market uh, and using them to replace these workers with lower opportunity cost and perhaps lower uh, productivities. Uh, so I'm not so sure that it's, it, you can say that those workers who retain their jobs are actually better off. The workers who have the jobs uh, after the minimum wage is imposed may be a different set of workers than the, than, uh, than the workers who were in fact being employed at W. Uh, one, some economists have also said that with the minimum wage, um, employers are urged to discriminate. That is, they have this surplus and they only need this many workers. Well, then if, um, if employers are prejudiced against blacks or women's or, or Indians or, or whatever, then they can uh, choose um, the workers of their own uh, preference. But I think in order to fully understand the minimum wage, again, you must understand that employers can adjust the conditions of work and will be encouraged to do so because of the, of the benefits of adjusting the conditions of work. Let's consider uh, the prospects of, of, um, of employers uh, providing their, their workers with some uh, fringe uh, benefit. In providing their workers with some fringe benefit, you can imagine that the fringe 
will in fact result in more people being uh, willing to work uh, at this job. And we might uh, note that as a consequence, the supply curve uh, increases as a result of the availability of the fringe. This vertical distance here, A, B, can be some indication of the value that, uh, it, that workers put on the fringe uh, benefit. That is, at one time they needed a wage of, of A in order to provide a quantity of labor equal to uh, Q2. Now with the fringe benefit, uh, they're willing to work uh, for as little as, as this wage rate here, B, whatever that happens to be over on the uh, vertical axis. So the supply curve can be expected to uh, increase. And employers would be uh, happy for that result in spite of the fact that the fringe benefit may uh, cost them something. The reason is that um, everybody uh, can be uh, better, better off. That is, with the availability of the fringe benefit, the supply curve expands outward. The demand curve uh, decreases, and the reason for this is that um, uh, the fringe benefits are, are costly. That is, because of the fringe benefits, uh, employers would, will not be willing to pay their workers as, as much. Uh, they once were willing to pay this quantity of workers, uh, C, now they're only willing to pay them a D, mainly because the cost of the fringe benefit is, is here, cost of a fringe. Now we have a decrease in, in the demand, an increase in supply, and we know that the new equilibrium is going to be there, which means that as a result of the provision of the fringe benefits, the um, a wage will go down from W1 uh, to W2. But uh, no matter, uh, both employers and employees can be better off. The employees are better off, even in spite of the fact they suffer wage uh, reduction equal to W1, W2, mainly because, again, this vertical distance here, A prime, B prime, is greater uh, than the wage reduction. In effect, when you add in the fringe benefits, uh, the workers uh, uh, get a wage of W3. That is, they get a money wage equal to W2, but then they get the fringe benefit equal to A prime, B prime, which adds up to uh, W3. So the workers are, are better off. The employers are better off because uh, they pay a lower wage, W2, instead of W1. Uh, they have to incur a greater cost equal to CD, which can be equal to D prime, B prime. And as a consequence, they pay less in terms of wages. They, they incur greater costs here, D prime, B prime, uh, but they're better off to the tune of the difference between the wage reduction and the increase in cost uh, that they incur. Everybody is, is better off as a result of this, uh, of this fringe benefit. You can also imagine that um, uh, employers would be willing to um, uh, reduce work demand. Uh, as uh, mainly because by reducing work demands, the supply curve of labor may go out by uh, A uh, or S1 to S2. The productivity of workers can suffer and demand curve can decrease. That is, employers can be willing to pay them uh, less, but so what? Everybody can be better off, as we explained, under the uh, fringe uh, of benefits uh, case. 